hit in cool places like Tel Aviv. Great software. Seriously, that's all you got? Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready? Do we want to back into that? You can use DNA. Boy, those robots look cool performing. Hello. So my name is Amin Ronaha and I have been doing open source in the Python community for a very long time. I built the Flask micro framework um, and a bunch of libraries which it uses. And as of about two years ago, I'm working with uh, friends and colleagues on an open source project called Sentry, which is also uh, available as a software as a service business. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to try to show a little bit how we're doing this, how we're building an open source project, but at the same time having a product which makes money and which we can deliver regularly um, to our own infrastructure and at fixed intervals to, uh, to customers who want to run it on their own installations. Um, the slides will be on this URL. And since there might not be enough time for questions, uh, if, you have, if you want to reach out, just talk to me. Um, and, and we can discuss open source uh, and, and open source as a business especially uh, afterwards to no end. Um, so this is us and we are basically an error reporting system. So if you have an, a project, um, doesn't matter if it's backend, if it's JavaScript, if it's a mobile application, you can integrate a little client and then whenever it crashes it reports to us and you can have it grouped up. Um, so it will just give you a basic overview of the errors, but we also have like stack traces um, for JavaScript. We can do like minification. So basically, you will figure out that your application doesn't work, and you can figure out why. Uh, and we can send you emails and so forth. Um, so we do it for JavaScript, Python, Ruby, PHP. Um, we do it for iOS now, um, and and for some languages we have like deep integration with local variables and so forth. Um, and um, we also launched this thing where you can see what happened before the error happened. So like log, log messages, uh, which UI interaction you had and so forth. Um, so it should give you an idea of what the product is roughly looking like. Um, but for us, it's basically two products in one uh, internally as we look at this. So we have the Sentry open source product, which is a 100% open source uh, repository, which runs the, where there's basically the entirety of the code base in there. Um, but then we also have this internal app called Get Sentry, which con includes billing, quota management, invoicing, customer support, all the kind of stuff which is relevant for the cloud hosted version. Um, and so this has some interesting challenges because when I, at the previous company I worked at, we had sort of this idea that um, it is an is it is closed source project and we can build our infrastructure specifically to uh, what's interesting for us and and we don't have any real constraints on this. Um, and w when you ha when you have this 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 mentality that you want to have it as an open source project, but you also want to push it to customers um, as quickly as possible on your own infrastructure, um, you need to make this mental split of both being stable all the time, but then having like really even more stable releases that you can do every six weeks and so forth. Um, so this is kind of how we do this. We have the main repository, which is the open source version. Um, this is what releases monthly or every six weeks, I think, um, to customers. So we're making stable tags of this. Um, and this is basically what becomes our on-premise installation. And then this is also being used regularly, like every couple of, like whenever someone presses the deploy button, it also deploys whatever is on master on this repository to our cloud solution. Um, and this goes hand in hand with this other repository which we have where there's billing quota and so forth. So these two things go together, um, um, like hand in hand. Um, so when when we started doing this uh, century as a, um, as a as a SaaS business, basically, we were a very small team. Um, it was basically the founder of the company uh, plus one other guy and then a, a half guy, and now we're like 25 people, uh, I think, give or take. Um, so we had to adapt our process a little bit, uh, but we wanted to keep this 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 very very agile way of of doing developers uh, doing development and. So we want to keep, we want to have more process, but we want to keep the process as like straightforward as possible. We have this idea that 
anyone should feel very uh, safe doing a, an immediate deploy um, uh, to, to to production. Right now we're in two locations. The majority of the developers is in San Francisco. We also have a, t a small team in Austria. Um, and so we have a little bit of this distributed um, environment thing going on. But for us, it comes kind of natural because it is an open source project at the core. So all of the all of the processes are in the repository. Everybody can see like to some degree like what the bugs are, um, wh what, the, what the whole thing is uh, moving, like the roadmaps and so forth. So we push a lot of this um, this knowledge which people should have uh, as developers just naturally into this uh, repository where we can go. So we have, we, we might have this problem of like isolated islands of knowledge, but we try to keep it as close as possible to like a centralized location. Um, so the, the goal that we have internally for running our infrastructure is um, we want to deploy as quickly as possible and to make it as hard as possible to screw up. Um, so we, we try to make sure that our rollbacks are as fast as possible, that um, that when we do ship a bug for whatever reason to production, that we can just go back to the earlier version. Um, and then separately to that, we want to make sure that every um, w once a month or so, we want to tag off a release for the on-premise installation. And this is actually very so a surprisingly tricky problem. And I think a lot of people that want to do an on-premise installation out of a SaaS business they have afterwards are struggling with this part a little bit. This idea that you have to, that you don't want to give up the uh, this agile nature of deploying like as quickly as you can, but then not having a huge uh, management overhead in, in doing these uh, this regular releases to customers. So the work we have for this is uh, we just do regular commits. We use GitHub for the majority of our stuff. Um, so we have, uh, we try to not have too many repositories, but it's kind of hard on GitHub. Um, so we have a few of them, um, and they are all kind of set up the same way. So people just commit, someone reviews it, um, it goes through a continuous integration, um, and then eventually we deploy it. Um, so this requires a good test coverage, and we want to make sure that our local test setup is the same. Um, so what this means is that for one of the problems that I think it's very easy to just keep on pushing away until you, you, you stop seeing it as some as some goal that you should solve is the idea that production and development shouldn't actually diverge too much. Um, so it's very hard to replicate the entirety of the um, of uh, of the of the development environment. Sorry, of the production environment on your own computer. Like that would be a lot of work. You don't want to have all of those services running, but at least you should. So we'll be trying to keep the general same behavior going. So we have um, a processing pipeline. So we are also running this locally. We're, so we, we do go through multiple processes, even in local environment, but people might be running a different queue system. Um, but we do try to keep the local setup as close as possible to production. Um, and we, we don't want to solve this issue by forcing people to have virtual machines running. So we actually set it up locally to support that. Um, so our goal is to make developers like not push bugs and other things in, into product, into like the code base, obviously. So we do have, uh, we, we set up in all repositories that we are running, we have local support to setting up local hooks so that we catch these things before they actually go into a commit message even. So all of the repositories that really matter have a local linter hooks set up so that when you try to commit something um, and it fails linting, it doesn't actually go in. Um, that catches a whole bunch of stuff that uh, would otherwise be only caught in um, in continuous integration. And our test suite actually takes quite some time to run. I think it takes about five minutes, and then we have multiple matrices going on, like different configurations because we support Postgres, MySQL. Um, so just having a bunch of stuff run as quickly as possible, even before it even goes to another server, is, is great. Um, so this is, looks roughly like this. We have one release a month for the on-premise solution. We have give or take five deploys a day for hosted is, I think it's getting a lot more now. It used to be that whenever people felt like they want to get something pushed out, like someone presses the deploy button. Um, we do trigger off the deploys manually. We don't do it like it deploys automatically based on master moving because master moves more than we want deploys to go out. Um, so this is roughly what this looks like. Uh, this is basically um, a lot of pull requests going in uh, on a regular basis. Um, 
and and people just pressing deploy as as so we the feature development is happening pull requests and then it goes into master and master is always in a in a good state so master is stable um we we don't do like git flow or something like this which where you have like multiple branches and then you have like this other master branch develop which eventually moves into master so we only have pull requests and master um so someone who makes a new feature just branches of master makes a pull request and, and then someone else merges um this is um this has the sort of uh, downside that you don't want to have pull requests lingering around for too long um, so one of the questions that uh, comes up with this often is what do you do when you have a huge feature do you like do you, how do you deal with like these enormous features and we're just basically breaking them up into smaller parts and we're shipping into mass as quick as possible and we're hiding them from the UI um, so you will actually have a lot of partial features sitting in master which are not fully functional um, because they come in piece by piece and this is also interesting that we are actually shipping code like this to the on-premise installation that people run so a lot of our customers have on their own service when they're running it have have code on there which we can't see um, but it's already there and doing something to some limited degree um, the, the most important thing for us is avoiding downtime so we want to have this opportunity to deploy as quickly as possible so we don't want to have downtime um, we are okay with some slow time um, but we, we, d we never want to bring up like system and maintenance thing um, and so that that has to be something that goes into the culture of, of, of development that you don't write database migrations which require offline processing that would require you to take the entire thing down um, so how do we do this um, the the main data that we have goes into Postgres um, that doesn't include like a lot of this blob data, like the huge amounts of event data, but it it covers everything that you can search, uh, all the metadata, all the uh, all the user data. And with Postgres, it's very nice actually being able to do transactional data uh, schema updates. So if the migration actually goes wrong for some reason or another, you can actually roll this back reasonably safe. Um, uh, when we see that stuff is slow, we suppose we can build indexes in the background without having to block the entire thing, which is great. Um, alter table for as long as you only add new columns uh, is, is, is good. So we the way we kind of dealing with this, we have this informal uh, like review policy on, on the data migrations and, and someone with knowledge on, on, on how data migrations are fast or slow will, will sign off on them and make sure that a developer doesn't ac accidentally make an alter on a table which has like millions of rows which would block the entire thing. Um, and because we we want to support rollbacks. We also make sure that as part as the, the data layout goes, we, we support bidirectional compatibility with all the versions. So all the code can see new database and new database can work perfectly in all the code. So if we switch between these steps where we might have pushed out a migration, but it's very high risk migration, um, we make sure that the migration goes in a couple of like commits before code that actually depends on a new data goes in. Um, in addition, we internally memorize a little bit those problematic migrations so that we don't tag off um, a release that goes into the on-premise solution that people like install once a month as an update. So that we make sure that those are super stable migrations. Um, so. The, 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 the tricky thing with this bidirection compatibility is that you have to structure it in a way that you anticipate a little bit what's going to happen in the future. So for instance, we had uh, a bunch of features where we had huge database changes and we actually had to make sure that those get, went in like a day early because nobody else could like really make sure that we don't accidentally depend on this new data layout. So you need to test this manually and to some degrees that the, the data migration changes that you push in um, don't other people don't accidentally depend on this um, but once you know that the system is running well um, you can it's fine anyways um, but for as long as the fear is that you have to roll back to an early version it, it can get tricky also um, there's with this part of bidirectional compatibility, there is this really scary situation which you have when you deploy old code and new code concurrently. So like one worker goes down and it used to run old code, it comes up with new code. That these two things don't have bad interactions with um, is, a, is a scary thought. I don't know um, how many of you uh, know of the Knight, um, uh, I don't know what the company is called, it's Knight Investing, I think. It was a high frequency trading company which 
pushed out an update which basically destroyed their company. Um, they had a trading engine and they repurposed um, an instruction bit they used previously for some feature. Um, so they, someone uh, decided that they're going to repurpose this instruction bit and they pushed out, uh, like they made one deploy with one new machine to test the deployment and all the old machines went crazy because the new, c the new machine used this bit for a different purpose than the old machines and the old machines which still had this old code running just went completely nuts and then they shut down the new machine but the old machines were still seeing all this this crazy data and within a, like 25 minutes they traded their entire savings away that the company had like i think they, they ruined a couple of million hundred millions of dollars with this problem that they had old code and new code running and they didn't actually see that this was their issue uh, until they lost everything they had um, so that's that's a scary thing and also uh, when you do this like feature deploys where you, like try to push a feature to part of the code the user base you have to be aware that it means that all the new stuff goes at the same time um, for us um, we 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 get a little bit away with this idea of running old and new stuff at the same time and uh, hiding this um, this latency that goes with migrations because we structure our system uh, that we have this user interface that people see but we have our in ingestion system where all the events go um, and in between those stands a queue so we can actually push stuff into the queue and have it standing there for a while if migrations go and then maybe some events will be a couple of seconds late but the UI will still work fi fine um, the downside with this is that um, the, the first part wi which gets the event might get on the old API, um, old API version, or like if there was a change and then on the queue, when it finally pops out of it, it, it runs on your code. Um, so you need to be aware of this. Um, uh, for, uh, for, for this for this queuing system, you can also um, take advantage of this for, f so that's something that we don't do, but that's something that I did for my previous company, where when you want to deploy very often, it kind of runs a little bit um, against what you want to do with WebSockets. Um, so if a WebSocket connection needs to be terminated whenever you sh push out a deploy, it's annoying because everybody comes in and reconnects and it gets really slow. Um, so what I, what I did in my previous company was that we actually terminated our WebSocket connections on a hub, which ve very rarely updated. So this hub kept running for a long time and then we used the queue to communicate to the workers and the workers would just like update independently. So you could push deploys to the workers like every 15 minutes and the, the WebSocket connections could stand open for like 24 hours because the code that was actually caring about the WebSocket connection didn't have to update it often. Um, and that requires to have some understanding of supporting like this old version for the WebSocket hub and, and, and everything else that keeps the worker code running. Um, so if we want to push out updates as quickly as possible uh, it's and, and have the risk as low as possible, we want to test it obviously um, and make sure that we also cover the test cases that people don't test locally for. Um, so for that we use uh, Travis. Um, we have an open source project obviously so we can use a lot of the open source infrastructure that Travis provides. Um, but since we also have our own internal billing system and so forth, we also use the commercial version. Um, for the open source version, we are testing everything. Uh, so we test setups we don't run ourselves. We run Postgres, um, but we support MySQL. So as part of the open source test suite, we also test MySQL, SQLite, and a bunch of other things. Um, for our, and, and this, I should say that this, these tests do not run uh, mandatorily before our deploys. So you can actually ship an, uh, an update that breaks MySQL, and it will be OK um, for as long as it only affects the open source version. Um, because we have quite a few, uh, quite a bit of time before we have to push it to the customer. So we can have a partially broker master for MySQL and that will be okay. Um, for the, our own deploys that go to our own infrastructure, these will not, like the tests have to pass, otherwise the deploy will not go through. And that only tests the code is actually relevant to us. So we'll only test Postgres. Um, and for instance, it will make sure that uh, it also tests some of the functionality, which the open source version doesn't care about. Um, for con actually doing continuous delivery, we don't actually do it uh, automatically. Um, and the way we set up the system is that, that the builds that we built for the testing on the test suite are independent of the builds that we are building for delivery. Um, so this is 
historically grown that we don't have a build system that builds a build and then tests it and then ships it to like production uh, that these are split up into individual things um, doesn't have a very good reason but it actually comes with some advantages which is that creating the build for production takes us we, we made it from scratch and it takes a little bit longer to create than actually the time it takes to run the tests on Travis so on Travis we actually use a lot of caching from webpack dependencies from like Python wheels or like Ruby gems or something like this, um, um, and sometimes these caches corrupt, and then you need to wipe the cache, and it takes longer to make the deploy, um, ma make the test. But for continuous delivery, we want to actually make sure that we build it from scratch. Um, so we we built our own system for actually shipping up the code, which is inspired by uh, Heaven. Uh, we call it Freight, um, and it it's configurable on a per project basis basis, and it's a little bit. Um, it works like this. It it listens to Travis or whatever use uh, we use for for testing for this project. We build it and then we ship it to production. Looks a little bit like this. Um, it's open source as well. You can use it if you want. Um, and we mostly interface with it uh, through Slack and um, and not as much through the web interface. So you can just have Hubert deploy this. Um, the annoying thing is that dev environment never entirely matches production, and because of that. Um, it happens every once in a while that people sh ship something up um, that was supposed to work but doesn't really. Um, and so it's very Im important for us to have the, the fast rollbacks. And that's also the reason why we make sure that the builds are fully independent of each other so that we don't reuse caches in weird ways. Um, so we, we use Docker, we keep the old builds around, it's like individual uh, Docker images and we can just rapidly fall back to the one before. So while it takes us, I think, 15 minutes to go to a newer version, to going back to the old one, I think is like less than 20 seconds, hopefully. Like it depends a little bit. I didn't actually time it. But going to an earlier version should be super fast. Um, and the idea is also that if a new developer comes on board, um, it, there is a huge mental issue you have. is like the first time you press the deploy button. And by like having by can by being able to guarantee to you to a to the newcomer on in the company that it's okay to screw up we will like worst case it was 20 seconds of failure um takes away this 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 huge fear and that's good because the moment you have this fear you definitely will make terrible decisions um and just taking away the fear of actually deploying is is very important to us um, code structure wise to support this, um, I, I like, I don't know where this came from originally, but large systems are like organisms. Um, and that's so true for the moment you have like more than 10 servers, like actually predicting what they're doing is almost impossible. Um, which is a fun problem, but also scary in many other ways. Um, it's often like you look at the graph and it doesn't really make any sense. And then you realize that these systems have, have weird interactions and, 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 and then you can like, can try to find the root cause of what makes this fluctuation a graph. Um, but it's, it's almost like you're a doctor and you're trying to figure out what, what the problem of the patient is. Um, so the biggest issue that why it's behaving more like an organism and less like code is uh, because not everything runs the same code at the time. We had a lot of issues with this with JavaScript initially where we we didn't separate the builds good enough. We used to make the builds directly on the machines. So we had like say 30 machines and each machine would make the build independently. And then the caches would mis uh, mismatch. Um, we didn't use shrink wrap for NPM at the time. So it was possible that they didn't actually have the exact same version of, an, of a transient dependency. And then it's just really bizarre. Um, so there's a lot of this stuff which makes sense to like build once and then ship to a uh, bunch of machines. Mm. Um, the the other problem that you have with this is that um, what runs in production is also for that reason not entirely what you run locally because the data schema changes independently of the code. It's like that's intentional for us. We want to migrate the database before we do the code update, but it does mean that it's very hard to replicate this this exact case um, in in the test suite. So we we had this issue I think more than once where. Um, where stuff was running and it wasn't entirely compatible to the data model. Um, because we only run one branch, um, like master, and then pull requests off this, um, we we don't want 
we, we need to make sure that we break up larger features into smaller things. And that's also one of those really interesting things you have where because a larger feature, let's say, which takes you six months to deliver is being broken up into like one week at a time things. You have a lot of this code coming into master, um, which is effectively disabled for a user. Um, but every once in a while, we, we want to see what the feature will look like and we enable it for our own account. Um, and it happened that we broke the UI for the customer, but we didn't see it for ourselves because we had the feature flag enabled for, for us, um, which is uh, weird <laughs> and annoying when it happens because you feel like, like how did we not see this? Um, it's because we don't, we literally couldn't see it. Um, so we, we use feature flags to hide this code which comes into master but is not entirely ready yet. Um, we have two sets of feature flags at this point, some which users can opt into, so they can have the early code running for themselves, like it's usually user interface changes. And then we have the super secret features, which you could enable if you run the open source version, but we, it's not available for customers on the software as a service uh, uh, version of it. Um, and it, it happened that we shipped out features to on-premise, which were entirely gone by the time, um, like the users never saw it because we decided against the feature. Um, but but technically it was in the code base. Um, to support this this uh, from a repository status, um, we are trying to move towards monorepos, which is super hard uh, because Git doesn't really do that well, um, and GitHub definitely doesn't do that well. Um, so we we are moving it into things a little bit more like monorepos. So we used to have a lot of plugins for Sentry. We are now moving them into one centralized repository. So it's only one plugin repo instead of Previously, it was like 20. Um, so we're, we're trying to consolidate things as close as close together as possible. Also helps with actually making the builds. Um, for making it as straightforward as possible, we try to reduce the, the number of moving parts. Um, for development, we want to keep a lot of the parts that are running in production, but we want to have fewer of them. Um, I have a strong belief that people, it, if it takes too long for your local installation to start up, um, developers are starting to do s really stupid hacks and like, oh yeah, I, that was a typo and I'm just going to fix the typo, I'm not going to test it because it will take me 15 seconds. So this 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 idea that you actually don't test the last part um, is, is annoying. So we try to keep the dev environment mingle, um, not mingle, uh, nimble. Um, and so there are fewer parts running in dev, um, and and then it obviously becomes a part how do you keep dev and and prod alive? We uh, I that that might not be company policy, but it's definitely a policy that I have. Uh, I don't think that virtual machines and Docker are acceptable devel development environment. It's getting a little bit better, but there are so many issues that just like I don't know. I I find it frustrating, and I would like to keep keep it always running so that people don't have to fall back to this. Um, I already talked about these rep 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 reproducible builds, that a build should be like the same on all machines, but ideally we can also make this exact same build from scratch. Um, since we are a Python shop, we use pip freeze, which is shitty, but um, it's the best we have. Uh, for JavaScript, we used to use uh, run no shrink wrap. Um, I think we might still do that, but Yarn is here now, and Yarn is much better. Yarn is basically freezing out all the dependencies to like, to the last degree and pins it uh, in, in the same way. So you actually commit the lock file um, and, and you have, at least as far as JavaScript goes, you have the same dependencies installed. Um, we used to have this that, um, I, I think everybody remembers pad left, where like all of a sudden certain machines couldn't run anymore because they tried to npm install a package which was gone for reasons. Um, so it, it is very frustrating when you have like this one machine behaving differently because reasons. So yeah, um, now we build once and we ship too many machines. So that makes problems. Um, it's fine for as long as you only do it for source code, like Python uh, source code, JavaScript source code, and so forth. The moment you ship a binaries, the issue becomes a lot more complex. Um, because you need to hi have them all running at a compatible Linux version. Um, and then how do you do binary dependence locally uh, gets a little bit tricky. So we we limit ourselves to OS 10 for like we built all of the binary stuff for OS 10 for if developers want to use OS 10, which most of them want so far, maybe it will change. Um, 
and then we use what's called many Linux. Um, and many Linux is is I think it came from the Python community, but it's the idea that you build a binary dependency which works which works on um, multiple systems. Um, and the way this works is you install CentOS 6, which is a super old version of Linux, and you compile everything on there. And because it uses old glibc, uh, it supposedly it works on newer versions. Um, turns out it doesn't work on Alpine Linux, it doesn't work on a whole bunch of other things that are popular in the Docker world, um, but it gets us somewhere. Um, and so with that, we have the ability to actually upgrade uh, Ubuntu versions as well, if we have to do it. So we don't have to upgrade all the machines in one go, we can update one machine to a new Ubuntu if you choose to do so. Um, and we do this for C, C++, and Rust extension modules. Um, and it's it's a nightmare. But thankfully, we can use Docker for this. So I actually can build many Linux wheels, on, like Python packages, on my local machine through Docker. And it's a, it's a stupid experience because like CentOS 6 at this point is very old. It doesn't do, like you can't do HTTPS requests to servers which are shipping up certificates with a server name uh, as an I because it doesn't support that. Um, is I think Cent I don't know how old CentOS 6 is at this point, but I think it's like six or seven years old. It's crazy. Um, anyways, but that's the environment that they have for, for binary dependencies, and it's not super great, but it means that we have freedom in regards to where we deploy it. Um, so we, we target, as to what we support, we target Debian, Red Hat Linux, and Ubuntu, where we run Debian for the most part in our Docker images. Um, but we know customers run this thing on uh, Red Hat um, Enterprise Linux. Eventually, we'll support Alpine and stuff like this, I think. But right now, so that's basically this minimal Linux version that you have um, for um, for Docker images as a base. Um, but we won't do it. Last part is we want to monitor failures. We we can use ourselves for this since we're a century. Um, we try to associate the failures that are coming up with the users, so we can reach out to the users and tell them, "Hey, um, you like you encountered an internal server error, but we fixed it." Um, so we 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 map support requests to failures, um, oh, and you can kind of do this with Sentry. So you should definitely try that. Um, this I think is just fun. So. Uh, replace yourself with friendly robots. So we have a lot of those GitHub uh, robots which are doing things like synchronizing repositories and submodules. Um, we do a lot of these GitHub hooks which just make it nicer to see the failures. We're using Danger now to uh, double check on um, commit messages and stuff like this. Um, we use Slack as a centralized communication hub for a lot of those things. Um, and it's just, I think it makes an overall better development climate to have these little helpers that, that do funny things and, and, and just take away ma mundane tasks from humans. Um, so yeah, more robots um, and reducing the fear of, of, uh, of failure for a user, uh, for developer means that they can ship their own fe first feature on the first day of work. Um, and I think that's very motivating uh, as a developer that, like, that it, you can have some, like, you, I think our onboarding task now is like build your own feature and get it shipped in the first like day. And I think that's just supporting that as a, as a company culture is, is quite good. Um, yeah, and it also like shipping updates out very often and like having a tight loop with the user is just like when it happens that someone actually tweets about it, it's great. Like we had, we had a lot of feedback where people were like, oh, how, how did it happen that you got this feature out so quickly? Like, and, and it helps for us to be an open source project because we can also show them the issue that was associated with this feature request. Or it's like, for instance, uh, if a user had a bug and it, he went to the support forum, uh, so f to the support tracker, we can actually make a GitHub issue, link it in the support tracker, and you can, like, the user can see sort of in almost real time uh, how, how the bug fix is going. Uh, which also puts a little bit of fire under your butt, but um, it's good. Yeah, and if you have any questions to this, uh, reach out and talk to me. I'm always interested in discussing development sort of principles and, and shipping this kind of stuff. Also, if you want to make your own open source project into a commercial enterprise, um, happy to discuss that as well. <laughs> Thank you very much.